Northwest Public Radio, KRFA 91. Good evening. This is the Wednesday, May 28, 2014 meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. First uh, item on the agenda is approval of minutes from May 14. Second. Okay. Um, any observations or corrections that people had? I have a couple notes here, so I'm seeing. Okay. Um, one thing, Mike, I want to call to your attention. Um, you report, I've seen in the minutes relative to the rezone. You reported to us the Transportation Commission um, had some consideration of bike lanes on Notting Hill Street. We seem to have completely not addressed that. So I'm just calling it to staff's attention to make a decision about what they want to do when they go to council. And the other was the thought, if there's a realtor in the audience that's looking for something to do, I'm really interested in the question of, is there any evidence of the impact of adjoining densities on property values? There were statements at the rezone that having the R3 zone might negatively impact the property values of the adjoining, adjoining properties. And I've heard that before. Is there any evidence? Is there any data that would lead us to believe that? Is, is my question. And, you know, there was somebody who would, in the business, that might know. Other than that, um, if there are no other corrections, uh, we've got a motion in the second. So all in favor of approving the minutes of May 14, say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? I, I abstain. I abstain. Okay. So Jim, Joel, and Wendy have stayed. Great, thank you. Next up is correspondence. Anything from staff? Well, I could just give an update about uh, our council goal that we were looking at about expansion of the North Main Street uh, corridor. Uh, Bill had given a report to Public Works Finance Committee. We didn't have administrative committee this last uh, session. It was canceled. So he had just given it to Public Works Finance Committee. It was well received. And uh, they had given us direction to work with you and uh, to come up with maybe some code revisions, uh, particularly reduction of the 10-foot front yard setback for the motor business zone, as well as uh, incorporating residential uh, above or behind uh, commercial frontage. And so those were uh, kind of the two that were, um, you know, re very well received. And uh, it'll go on to council this next Monday on consent agenda. And so maybe they'll be able to discuss it a little bit at that point in time. Uh, but it was well received, and uh, hopefully we'll be moving forward with that. Okay. So you recall we had a series of discussions. <coughs> we asked council for direction, and it sounds like they're about to give us direction. So if it's agreeable amongst you, why don't we say to staff now, if council does give us direction, proceed, because it will be another week and a half or more before we get back together. Okay. Thank you. Um, tonight is the night to invite if people would like to submit uh, electronic readings for our optional readings. Uh, Bill Belknap is our editor. And um, you can just send him links if you have something that you think is of interest. And then in two more weeks, we'll have an opportunity if people want to discuss those. Um, I talked with Bill a little bit and would like to propose a new category that we also consider, which would be land use and climate change, land use planning and climate change. We've got some others that are like legacy crossing. There are things that we have worked on in the near past or the ADU, things that we're working on coming forward. But I'm 
thinking there's another category we might want to think about. And, and possibly even just pl urban planning and climate, climate change. change. There's quite a few articles I was Googling today okay. on that topic that would be relevant to smaller cities. Okay. So. Bill seemed to think he had several not on that topic, but I can't remember what the other topic was that <coughs> might make a packet of three or four. And it seemed to be that was kind of liked. I have certainly liked it when it's a th little bit more thematic. So. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll advance that idea, Wendy. Okay. And uh, if you have some, please send them forward. Okay. All right. Any other correspondence items? Joel, Transportation Commission meeting? It'll be a short report. Uh, I was in Europe at the time of our last <coughs> meeting. Uh, missed that. And uh, our next meeting, I believe, will be on June 11th, and I have not yet seen an agenda. Uh, okay. Mike, you, you didn't attend the, the, the meeting, did you? Uh, I believe we reported on the meeting at the, okay. at the last Planning okay. and Zoning Commission meeting. We had that reviewed well Ridgeview be. Estates and uh, a couple other items during that. Okay. Great. Thank you. So at this point in our agenda is the open <coughs> microphone. Members of the public may speak to the commission regarding matters that are not on the agenda or currently plan pending before Planning and Zoning Commission. If you would like to do this, please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and limit your remarks to three minutes. Any takers? All right. Uh, we will move on to approval of relevant criteria and standards. There are two things. Let's take them as separate activities, uh, just so that we get two separate motions. First, let's look at the rezone of this property generally located directly north of Highway 8 and east of Ridgeview Estates, addition to the city of Moscow, <coughs> called Ridgeview Estates 2nd Edition, LPU 2014, Six. So last time we directed staff to create these relevant criteria and standards. Any comments? And yes, I was struggled for a while too to separate the two very similar looking documents. Is there a motion? I move that we uh, approve the reasoned statement of relevant criteria and standards for the rezone application. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Wendy, second. <coughs> All right. Any other discussion? All in favor of approving the rezone's relevant criteria and standards, say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Abstentions. I, I abstain. Joel is abstaining. Thank you. So that passed, Anne. Uh, and then we have the relevant criteria and standards to approve for the preliminary subdivision plat, LPU 2014 7 Anyone care to make a motion? I'll move to accept. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. So that's that. All in favor of approving the relevant criteria and standards, say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? I abstain. Joel again abstains. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, we are up to a public hearing. Uh, for a proposed rezone and preliminary subdivision plat for property addressed as 645 Table Court and legally described as Track D of Robinson's Track Subdivision Area of City Impact Application LPU 2014 9 and LPU 2014 12. Uh, before we get started, Mike, let me remind folks how a public hearing works. Um, Mike will present the information, and then I will open the public hearing and invite the applicant to speak, 
and then invite the public to speak in three categories. The first, people speaking opposed to it. Second, people speaking in favor. Third, people who have just a comment of a general nature. Then we'll allow the applicant an opportunity for rebuttal if they wish. Then I'll close the public hearing and the board will uh, discuss the merits of the situation. Uh, if you are going to speak, please come up to the lectern and use the microphone, state your name and address for our record. Thank you. Can I slip in here yes. real quick? Yeah, this, uh, <clears throat> this request for a rezone is right in my neighborhood and it's probably almost a duplicate of something I'll probably be in front of the commission for in the next couple of years uh, for a rezone. And seeing as how it would make my rezone easier, the more there is, uh, I think I'm just going to recuse myself from this one and not be involved. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the commission. Before you today, we have a rezone request as well as a preliminary plat request at 645 Pavel Court uh, within the area of city impact. So uh, the proposal, basically two components, uh, proposing to rezone a 4.66 acre parcel of land uh, within the area city impact from the agricultural forestry uh, zoning district to the suburban residential zone. Also part of the proposal is a, a subdivision plat to divide off one, uh, one acre parcel uh, from the existing 4.66 acre parcel. And according to the uh, Area City Impact Agreement, cities required to conduct a public hearing and forward a recommendation onto the Board of County Commissioners. So just to familiarize yourself with the property, it's uh, <coughs> outlined in red at the center of your screen. You have Pavel Court uh, here running east-west, comes off of North Polk Extension here to the west. You've got the current city limits boundary uh, with the orange dashed line there. You can see it's uh, just on the outskirts of the city, uh, adjacent to it here to the south. You have various residential developments, uh, single-family homes basically surround the area. You've got Moscow Heiden Fur to the southwest as well as uh, uh, various trailer parks to the south and to the southwest as well. Looking at the comp plan, uh, land use designation, currently designated as suburban residential. So the lighter yellow color, uh, you can see dividing line here would be sub suburban residential. We've also got the auto urban residential zone uh, to the east as well as to the south. Uh, and you have a neighborhood conservation designation to the southeast. Looking at what that uh, comprehensive plan land use designation says, uh, once again, suburban residential, it's appropriate for larger lots on the fringe area development, generally at gross densities ranging from 0.85 to 1.55 dwelling units per acre. Uh, these areas are generally located within the northern reaches of the city along North Polk Road and Almond Mix Road where public services are limited. Topography is somewhat challenging and streets are currently developed to a lesser standard. The use of this designation should be limited to those areas that will not impede more intense development in the future where such intense development can be accommodated. And the appropriate current zoning designation is uh, suburban residential, coincidentally. So looking at the current uh, zoning map of the area, the property is currently zoned Ag Forest AF. You see a uh, large agricultural forestry zone there to the north and to the northeast, uh, as well as to the east. Directly to the west is the suburban residential zone, as well as to the northwest and to the southeast. You've also got a uh, multifamily residential zone uh, that encompasses mobile home parks to the south and to the southwest within the, the current city limits. This would be the proposal before you today, uh, basically to rezone the parcel uh, to suburban residential to coincide with the properties to the west and to the northwest. Taking a look at uh, what the suburban residential zone is. Uh, it's intended to create and protect permanent single family residential neighborhood uh, at very low densities. And because large areas are contained within lots in this zoning district, the demand for parking is to be satisfied by spaces uh, basically located entirely on private property. And the public improvements are to be designed to serve the rural low intensity uses permitted within this zoning district. Minimum lot size within the suburban residential zones, one acre, as well as the minimum lot width and the lot depth is 150 feet. 
That brings us to the proposal for the preliminary subdivision plat, basically to uh, carve off a one-acre parcel that would be representative in this northwest corner here, <laughs> which would leave the resultant parcel 3.66 uh, acres in size. Currently has an existing home on the resultant parcel, which would be quite a distance away from uh, the new lot which is created there. This was the plat that was uh, submitted. As you can see, you've got Pavel Court in that northwest corner, and there is a actually a cul-de-sac dedication. Uh, you can see the cul-de-sac there with the dashed line. Uh, as is common practice in the county, they typically do their right-of-way dedications, not fee simple, but through right-of-way easements, and that's what's occurred in this case. Uh, you can tell that it appears to be no cul-de-sac dedicated at the end, but in fact, there's actually uh, an easement that would that is uh, basically dedicated uh, the right-of-way for the cul-de-sac at the end of Pavel Court. Looking at the access and uh, streets in the area, basically North Polk is a collector designated mm -hmm. designation. Uh, it's currently 20-foot wide gravel roadway with no curb gutter sidewalks on either side of the street. And it has Hog Creek flowing on the east side, uh, which is currently the stormwater conveyance in the area. Pavel Court is actually a future minor arterial as uh, identified on our thoroughfare plan within the comprehensive plan. It's currently developed as a 24-foot wide gravel roadway with no curb, gutter, or sidewalks on either side of the street, basically our rural standard. Uh, the current single-family dwelling on the property also has access to Pavel Court. So that brings us to the thoroughfare plan, uh, which is adopted by the city within our comprehensive plan. Currently hasn't been adopted by the county, but you do see a, uh, the, basically the blue dashed line uh, is representative of a proposed minor arterial. <coughs> and so you have uh, Polk Street, which is a collector running north-south. Uh, you end up going to Pavel Court, which is uh, proposed by our comp plan to ultimately connect with Orchard Avenue uh, to the east there. And so that brings us to our recommendation. And uh, our recommendation is that the commission conduct a public hearing and upon consideration of any testimony received, recommend approval of the proposed rezone to the Latah County Board of County Commissioners with no conditions. And as far as the preliminary plat, uh, the commission conduct a public hearing and upon consideration of any testimony received, recommend approval of proposed preliminary plat to the Latah County Board of County Commissioners with two conditions. First one being that the applicant shall dedicate 30 feet and right away from the western property boundary to the <coughs> eastern property boundary of the subject property. And this is ordered in order to account for the future extension of Pavel Court, uh, which is shown on our comp comprehensive plan. And the second condition, recommended condition, the applicant shall increase the size of the one-acre parcel to account for the 30-foot right-of-way dedication for Pavel Court <coughs> in order to maintain uh, the minimum one-acre lot size for the suburban residential zone. So with that, I'd certainly want to entertain any questions that you might have. Questions for Mike? <laughs> When you say when you say dedicate the thirty foot easement, are you talking about? Uh, I'm sorry. You say dedicate the thirty foot right of way. Would that would that be an easement, or are you proposing a fee simple dedication? We would propose a fee simple dedication because that's the way it occurs in the city. Uh, a little bit different in the county with the easements. We would prefer to see a fee simple dedication, so that would be our recommendation. Currently, Pavel Court is a fifty foot wide uh, right of way that was dedicated. Uh, fee simple, and we would like to see that continue to the east, uh, at least on the, the southern 30 feet, in order to allow for that extension. And at the time, uh, maybe a, a property develops to the north, uh, they'd be able to dedicate 30 feet and ultimately extend that roadway for future development. Is there any uh, plan or idea of extending the roadway up through Orchard in the foreseeable future? Well, it's on our thoroughfare plan within the comprehensive plan. Typically, the way that happens is at the time of development. And so uh, as some of these lots are possibly subdivided in the future, that's the point in time where we would request, you know, like we are today, uh, requesting right-of-way dedication in order to ensure access to adjacent parcels uh, further on down the line. And so it typically happens when development or a proposal comes in 
uh, is when we recommend requiring that. Mike, is there any conflict between the cul-de-sac dedication and if this was if that was a fee simple dedication for the right of way? Does that conflict in any way? Does that cause any complications? Uh, no, it doesn't. Thank you, uh, Mike. The can can you help us think through the importance of this uh, recommendation for an easement? in terms of other places along in the city where we do or do not have the east-west connectivity, where we perhaps have missed opportunities in the past. It seems to me that the next place to go east-west as you go south is down at public. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to underscore what I think is an importance of, of this recommendation by staff is that if we don't pay some heed to maintaining our east-west connectivity, we're at risk of losing it and ending up with ever more of the city just being some north-south. We'd have Orchard, and we'd have Polk, we'd have 95, and we'd have Almond Mix. And that would be, if you wanted to go from a point on one to a point on the other, you'd have a very large, where, where I think. Er, well, I think you could point to this as an example. You know, uh, typically where we encounter it is, you know, as far as extension of utilities as well as streets, you know, say that that wasn't required and somebody uh, wanted to do a development over here and they had to come back and, you know, try to acquire property or build a street and extend utilities uh, further than they'd be required to do if we don't require that up to, you know, an easternmost property boundary of a parcel that's up for development. You know. okay, so it's just kind of step by step maintaining the access so that yep. the next guy it's and the next more or less equity for the next landowner when they want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Mike? All right, thank you. So I'll open the public hearing um, and we'll start with the applicant. Does the applicant have any comments to make? Name for an address for the record, please. David Nusma, 645 Pavel Court, Moscow, Idaho. Um, yeah, we're just simply trying to split off an acre so our son can build a house. So that's what all this is about, getting it rezoned so we can do that and doing the short plat. So it's simple. I don't have anything else to add, really. Okay. Questions here? Yeah, David. <laughs> Um, what what are your thoughts on the the uh, thirty foot dedication? Uh, they they sort of hinted at that um, as I was talking with uh, county and city that there might be uh, a request for that. The regulations I believe say um, each piece of property needs to have at least twenty feet of public access, and the way we were splitting it there, we gave each one forty feet of access onto the. Uh, Pavel Court and, and the cul-de-sac. So we thought we were meeting that, but I am not opposed to um, looking out for the guy to the east and dedicating some of that land to do that. Okay. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, is anyone in the audience here to speak? Uh, in favor of the application? Okay. <laughs> well, naturally, being, being a son, my name is Luke Nusma. I currently live at 422 East Lewis Street in Moscow. And um, I'd love to see this go through. Um, it's uh, something we've really been looking forward to. Um, we moved back to Moscow to be close to our family. And we have my wife and I have three little kids, another one on the way, so we'd love to be able to have the kids easily run over to see their grandparents and anyways when we enjoy this area a lot so that's it thank you any questions thank you all right anyone come to speak opposed to the application testimony of a general nature My name is Charles Craig, and I live at 585 Pavel Court. It's the piece that's uh, 
just to the west of where David has his property there. And I just have a, I guess this is appropriate for me to ask questions. I don't understand the 30 foot thing you're talking about. Where does that come into play there on that map? The 30 Mike, foot. Mike, could you show us? Probably a little bit easier to see on here because we have the right of way lines aligned. But basically, uh, the northern portion of his property would basically be 30 feet to the south. So you can see the center line of Pavel Court, and there's already been 25 feet dedicated here to the south uh, for the southern half of that right of way. Our basically our our collector arterial standards is 60 feet for minimum width of a right of way, and so that's why we're recommending 30 as opposed to 25 as far as the right of way. Uh, with but basically it'd be 30 feet um, probably encompass this triangular shaped piece here 30 feet running all the way to the east of the property that makes sense I, yeah, I understand it now so that um, that's just something at some point that the county or the city decided they were going to do and it's a pretty good sized chunk of David's property and now that I see that it's a pretty good sized chunk of my property so everything that we have established along that area just gets taken mm -hmm. is that what you're saying Mike well the 25 feet in front of your property has already been dedicated so you see the right here 25 feet okay so that's the southern half of the Pavel court right away the total right away width for Pavel court is 50 feet 25 and 25 okay so we're only requesting uh, 30 feet, so that basically be five feet beyond where the current southern boundary of Pavel Court is. On this new, but not on his property. We won't be requesting that on your property. It's basically just at the time of development, right? So um, he's requesting a land use action for a subdivision plat. So it basically just be from this property line here at the end of Pavel Court to the eastern property boundary of his would be okay. 30 feet okay that's all I had thank you thank you uh, any rebuttal from the applicant <coughs> okay all right I will close the public <coughs> hearing and the Commission will discuss the merits of this and Mike I guess I have a question there are two <coughs> actions here we should take them in order um, a rezone and then a preliminary plat do two separate motions correct okay because we need the rezone in order to approve the one acre minimum lot size for the preliminary plat correct as it sits ag forest zone is a 40 acre minimum lot size so okay uh, we would need that to come in that order okay so perhaps what we can do is focus our attention on the question of rezone and come up with a motion there and then uh, when we've resolved that, we'll know whether we're going forward with the other or not. I would move to approve the rezone of that property to suburban residential. Okay, thank you. Um, and Mike, for clarity, this is a recommendation we are making to the Board of County Commissioners. Correct. Okay. So you'd so be recommending approval. Rec yeah. In your the motion mind. is the recommendation of approval of to the, the rezone to, to the, the Board of County Commissioners. Board Correct. Of County Commissioners. Thank uh, you. Right. Has the motion been seconded? If uh, not, no. I will. <laughs> Joel has seconded. Thank you. Uh, any f discussion of the issues of the rezone? Just to turn it to suburban residential for that parcel. Uh, the uh, change to suburban residential is consistent with uh, existing uh, uh, property to the uh, to the west, uh, so it's a, uh, an expansion of the existing SR zoned uh, property. Um, and, Thank you. Uh, uh, it's <coughs> so I think it's consistent with the neighborhood, and, and it is a relatively hilly topography. My memory of that area. Uh, again, so the larger lot size is at least probably warranted. Any other discussion? I know this seems like sort of an open and shut thing, 
but the point of this is also to build the record of evidence um, in terms of justifying the this reason statement of criteria and the reason statement of criteria and standards. I would just echo that it's uh, consistent with surrounding. Seems consistent. Uh, the, with the, the trend to change change to SR. All right. Um, so we have a motion in the second uh, relative to the rezone. And Mike, do we also need to direct staff to create the reason statement? Correct. Do you have enough material, do you think, to do that? I do, yeah. Okay. So um, if you're willing to amend your motion such that we direct staff to write our reason statement. You could do a separate motion, or too. Or you could do it as a separate motion, either way. I guess I would, if I'm going to amend it, I would uh, amend it to direct staff to uh, um, approve the rezone with respect to the county. And to ask staff to write the reason statement. And to go ahead and write the reason, statement of relevant criteria and standards. Is that acceptable to the seconder? Yes, it is. All right, then. All in favor of the motion to approve the rezone, say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. I think we'll show Kurt as abstaining. Thank you. And now relative to the preliminary plat, which has the uh, two staff recommendations um, <clears throat> that come along with it. Mike, is it possible for you to flip the screen so that we can see the recommendations? Well, I move the uh, uh, that we uh, recommend to the county commission the approval of the uh, uh, of the subdivision and uh, with the two conditions as uh, uh, proposed by staff i would uh, i would like to accentuate the uh, the fir first of those uh, i i think it's extremely important uh, to uh, uh, maintain the uh, uh, the right of way uh, for this uh, um, it's one of, as uh, Nels has pointed out, it's one of the few uh, potential east-west uh, uh, connections in this part of the city. Um, the, the the next one to the south is is in fact uh, uh, public, and so long that's a long ways south. Mm -hmm. So as we see development in this area, I think it's going to be important to have uh, additional um, uh, east-west connection. And this is. A, Given the topography, uh, there aren't very many good places to put such. Well, find a good one and, and make sure you get it. Uh, Mike, in fact, perhaps we would like to even instruct staff that the, <coughs> I'm looking at the relevant criteria. The plat is not contradictory to the plan if there's a dedication of the right-of-way. <laughs> I mean, the plan has got that vision in it. We see that, I think, as important. And we would like to stress that in the relevant criteria, I think. Okay. Uh, other comments? I just had a quick question about, um, do, is the subdivision plat that we're looking at, um, does it reflect a co uh, compensating for the 30-foot loss by essentially moving south? I mean, it, it, it reflects the full one acre without the 30-foot right-of-way. Correct. Okay, Correct. so the one we're looking that, at is... Yeah, yeah. that, that okay. would be the reason for the second condition on there, that they right. increase the size to account right. for that. Yeah. Right. Right. And okay. that's already been taken care of. Okay. And then, Mike, will this actually come back to us at some point as a final plat, or is this the end of it? That, yeah, within our ACI agreement, basically we just conduct one we, hearing we and recommend, yep, and recommend the condition. Okay. Uh, recommend and then send up to the county. Um... I think we've already discussed. I mean, the reason that we're doing these in this order is to make this plat compatible with the subdivision ordinance. Um, again, I'm looking through the the reason statement here. Um, 
plat is considered of the natural features of the land. I think so. To the ext its parcels are fairly large, so it's fairly easy. Um, not expected to place an undue burden on public services or infrastructure. We're going to add one house, which is currently everything out there is on well and septic, so Correct. not much burden on infrastructure as long as we continue to dedicate the right of way. Otherwise, we're going to start to pile houses on without enough street. All right. Um, we have a motion, yes, with your underscoring of the statement. And do we get a second on Joel's motion? A second. Thank you. Becca? So, moved and seconded to approve the plat <coughs> and or recommend the approval of the plat to the commission uh, and direct staff to write the reason statement. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Kurt again. Thank you. So we have approved that. We're on to the next, find my agenda here, the next public hearing. Uh, and we'll repeat the process. Mike will make a presentation. I'll open the hearing, the applicant, people speaking in favor, opposed, general, rebuttal, and then I'll close the hearing and we will discuss. This is for a public hearing for a proposed rezone and preliminary subdivision plat for property address. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Moving down. Special mm -hmm. use permit amendment application to add six additional RV spaces to an existing recreational vehicle park in the multifamily R4 zoning district <coughs> per MCC 6-4-4A area of city impact application permit application LUP. 2014-0013. Mike. Thank you. So before you today, we have an amendment to an existing special use permit uh, within the area city impact for an RV uh, park to add additional six spaces to uh, the existing 15-acre or 15-space park. Excuse me. Approximately three acre parcel, once again within the area city impact, currently has 15 spaces. Uh, the applicant wants to add six more. It received a, a special use permit in, in 2010 to convert uh, basically an existing mobile home park into the, the current 15 space RV park. So once again, in, in accordance with our ACI agreement, city is required to conduct a public hearing and forward a recommendation. This time it's going to be Latah County Zoning Commission instead of the Board of County Commissioners. So uh, just to orient yourself to the property, it's in the center of your screen. Once again, outlined in red, uh, roughly three acres. You have Carmichael Road here to the east. You also have uh, Highway 8, Troy Highway, uh, running east-west here to the north. You've got Latah Trail identified here to the north. This is the current city limit boundary uh, for the city of Moscow, uh, the orange dash line there. You also have various other uh, mobile homes as well as residential, two-family, multi-family uh, within the, the area. Taking a look at the land use designation, currently designated as auto urban residential along with uh, the majority of the property in the, in the immediate vicinity. Current zoning of that property is currently R4, which is multifamily residential. Properties to the south and to the southeast are also R4. Uh, you have a swath of R1, which is single family residential to the east, uh, as well as to the, the far north and to the northwest there. Got an ag forest zone uh, to the west. You've also got a uh, farm ranch zone that encompasses the highway right away there to the west. So looking at what uh, our zoning code says about the R4 zone, basically provides for the most intense residential land use is permitted in the community uh, where adequate transportation access should be given high priority in determining the appropriate location for R4 zoning districts. And just coincidentally, RV parks are listed as a special use permit uh, within the R4 zone. So uh, this is just a, a closer aerial view of the property. Uh, this is taken from 2012. You can currently see the 15 space uh, RV park with a gravel access drive and the individual spaces here. Also developed a uh, turnaround area to the southwest. Uh, currently have a um, pump house here 
as well as an office of the property. So uh, looking at the site plan that was submitted by the applicant, basically showing those existing 15 spaces for RVs uh, located here. You also have uh, the proposed six spaces right here uh, to the northwest corner of the property. Applicants proposing uh, to maintain the 100 foot wide turnaround at that southwest corner of the property. You've got stormwater detention, kind of a natural drainage swale that goes uh, through the property to the southwest direction there. So uh, basically his proposal is to add uh, those six RV spaces. They're going to meet our standard, uh, which is currently 20 feet wide by 40 feet long with uh, 10 foot separation in between the two. And this is the landscape plan that was submitted uh, by the applicant. You can tell various canopy, understory, and shrubs uh, scattered throughout the property. You also have a type B buffer adjacent to Carmichael Road here to the east. Just wanted to go through our RV park standards. Uh, once again, the minimum lot size of each RV space uh, basically meets that requirement as proposed on the plan. Um, ten, feet, 10 foot of separation, he meets that one as well. Uh, toilet facilities and potable water. Basically all RV park facilities uh, which allow tents or recreational vehicles which are not self-contained or required to provide toilet facilities and potable water. Uh, at this time the applicant's not proposing to allow tents uh, or have potable water connections or proposed to be available to each RV space uh, via this private well. Uh, common open space. It says each RV space within the park is required to provide common open space exclusive of all setback areas and shall be developed with turf and trees. The size of open space shall be left to the discretion of the developer. So basically uh, previously they had dedicated about 0.8 acres in the northern portion of the property uh, to the open space and that was around 27 percent of the gross area of the park and with the proposed uh, expansion they're going to be taken up uh, there's basically going to be a slight reduction in that area uh, in the northwest corner of that property. Once again, there's no real hard number, no standard, just says it's up to the discretion of the developer and the, with the open space. Uh, trash receptacles basically have to be provided, shall be located no more than 150 feet from any RV space. It's got that centrally located dumpster uh, in the center of the property. So basically, when this application came before you uh, in 2010, they had to place a couple trash can receptacles uh, at portions dispersed on the eastern part of the property in order to account for that 150-foot requirement. Those pro proposed uh, six spaces are going to all be within the 150 feet, and so uh, they would meet the requirement there. Looking at setback and buffer requirements, uh, joining public streets, uh, basically it says a type B landscape buffer, uh, which consists of four canopy trees, six understory trees, and eight shrubs per 100 lineal feet, uh, has to be provided uh, when adjacent to a public street right away. So that's Carmichael uh, Road in this in this case, and so he has an existing landscape brush uh, buffer, which is quite dense and would satisfy the type B landscape buffer requirement. Uh, if it's adjacent to residential and industrial uses, uh, which it is adjacent to residential uses to the south, uh, there was a six-foot-tall fence that was uh, previously put up along the southern property line. The applicant and, uh, coincidentally owns the, the vacant property to the southwest, and uh, that'll be one of our recommendations that if he was to sell that property, uh, they'd be required to put up a, uh, a fence along, along that portion as well. But currently just vacant portion of property that's undeveloped right now. Uh, basically says if it's adjacent to undeveloped land, if it's under different ownership, basically a type A landscape buffer would be required. Um, once again, that, that property is owned by the applicant Landscaping uh, basically just identifies one canopy tree of 1.5 inch caliper and two shrubs of a minimum of 12 inches in height are required for every two RV spaces, uh, as well as common areas not utilized for structures, parking, other landscaping shall be covered by turf or other veg vegetative ground cover. It's pretty much all uh, native, has grass and other shrubs and trees, uh, which basically satisfy that landscaping requirement. Also looking at internal private streets, they're required to be a minimum of 28 feet wide, which includes a 20-foot wide surface with 4-foot shoulders on either side. 
Uh, the applicant has, has placed uh, three quarter inch process rock, six inches deep for the entire 20 foot, uh, 28 foot wide access drive as well as each RV space. And that's what he's proposing to do with the uh, expansion of the six. Um, also included in the proposal is that 100 foot wide RV turnaround area in the southwest corner that will also have to be uh, surfaced in the same manner and the existing uh, street shoulder turnaround area meet the current requirement. And so moving on to lighting, uh, basically he's already provided two freestanding lights within the proposed park, uh, one's at the watershed, one's at the refuse area. Uh, two free freestanding lights and staff's opinion should be sufficient in servicing RV park development. And then uh, also uh, the county has not adopted our, our lighting ordinance as well, so a little bit of a conflict uh, there. So utilities uh, basically serviced off the southeast sewer district for the sewer service and uh, has an existing private well uh, for water at the park. And so these are just some pictures that I had previously taken. Uh, obviously not today, but back in 2010. This shows the uh, Type B buffer uh, adjacent to Carmichael Road. This shows the spaces and the gravel uh, that he's placed on the roadway. That would be the dumpster location right there at the uh, center to west end of the park. Uh, this would be the area where the applicant's proposing to add the six additional RV spaces. This is just looking at that open space area to the north. You can see a car on uh, Troy Highway here to the north as well as uh, Lata Trail uh, cutting through. So he's got some native vegetation as well as some uh, grass. So that brings us to staff's recommendation before you tonight uh, is that the Planning Zoning Commission put forth a recommendation of approval of the special use permit application uh, for the expansion of an RV park to the Lata County Zoning Commission uh, with the following condition, that the Type A landscape buffer be required, uh, which is adjacent to the applicant's undeveloped land. Excuse me, the Type A landscape buffer requirement, which is adjacent to the applicant's undeveloped land, not be required at this time, but if the applicant sells the property in the future, then the Type A landscape buffer basically need to be developed at that point in time. I could certainly stand for any questions that you might have. Questions for Mike? So just to make sure I understand, the, the recommendation will be part of the, part of the actual permit. It will be written into the permit. Uh, it would be our recommendation or your recommendation okay. being forwarded uh, to Lata County yeah. Zoning Commission. And so okay. they have an option, I believe, to conduct their own hearing or accept our recommendation. Yeah. Uh, I believe that they accepted our recommendation last time because this was one of the conditions that we had placed on it before. The other was the condition that they he be required to install the six foot tall fence for that 240 foot section adjacent to the residential properties. And so that's been satisfied. And so there's no need for that requirement anymore. Yeah. Uh, but there is still this uh, outstanding issue with the adjacent property to the west, southwest yeah. that he owns. So yeah. So the best we can do is it'll be written into our recommendation. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Correct. Joel, uh, regarding um, the uh, buffers, is there no requirement for a buffer to the north uh, against the Lato Trail and the highway? Uh, it's not a public right of way, really. I mean, you know, it's a it's a trail, but. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I think there should be, but yeah. I'm, I, I guess uh, as a p point of information, I'm curious as to why, why there's not a, such a requirement. Um, it's basically just adjoining public streets is the language. So, so the streets that would be highways yeah, are not streets. <laughs> well, you have the, the old railroad right away which has been vacated for the trail right and so that's technically not a street yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's sort of a curiosity <laughs> right in terms of maybe the language ought to include i mean i don't know that, that it's, it's it's i'm not sure it's desirable, desirable in this instance but but, but it but might be in certain cases it takes a loophole it acts in a funny way yeah, yeah. To, perhaps to be considered as we uh do our revision of the zoning code, uh, whether that's an, an intentional yeah. or an unintentional consequence yeah. of abutting the trail. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, Joel, for calling that out. Any other questions for Mike? 
All right, I'll open the public hearing uh, and invite the applicant to come up and speak if desired. I'll wait if there's any rebuttals. I think uh, Mike did a great job of explaining that. Thank you. Um, so, is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the application? If so, please come to the microphone. Anyone who has come to speak opposed to the application? Please come to the microphone, ma'am. Thank you. Squeaky shoes, sorry. <laughs> My name is Lois Pritchett. I live right across the highway from it. Mm -hmm. I'm also the president of the Southeast Sewer District. My question is, to you, and I don't know the answer, because we have been working for a year and a half now trying to get a new contract with the city regarding the Southeast Sewer District and the city and who has the right for what. I'm wondering with this right now, who has the right say on the sewer part of this? Okay. Because uh, we've had three extensions. We're currently, again, waiting for the city to come back to us with a copy of a new proposal that we can do something with. I have emailed, again, the administrators. I was supposed to have a copy about three or four weeks ago. I still haven't got one. And if this goes through, then we're back in this problem of... Do our Southeast Sewer District have any say on this? Okay. Mike, do you have anything to share relative? To so <coughs> it would be serviced by Southeast because it's got yes. drops. Yeah, there, there's mains in Carmichael Road that he has a current connection to. Mm -hmm. And so basically, yeah, it would be serviced by the Southeast Sewer District, which ends up tying in our system off, of, off the booster station on Palouse River Drive. As I understand it, uh, Les McDonald, our public works director, is currently uh, working on drafting another, you know, contract. I think, like you mentioned, they already have uh, a few temporary ones that they've been working on over the years. Um, but they would just be subject to the current contract uh, that they're basically under. And I, I can't speak to that. I haven't been involved in, okay. in, that, in that process. See, the problem with that is... Our board may have questions with the current one, but we can't get a new one in yet, <laughs> okay. which is held up actually by the city. It's kind of a two-way sword. We're caught in the middle as a board. Okay. I understand it. So let me ask another question. What we're about to do is consider whether we recommend to the uh, Lytle County Planning Commission how they should proceed. Correct. Uh, is this a piece that we ought to be considering in our recommendation? Uh, I don't believe so. You know, it, when they had looked at the capacity of the district, Les McDonald indicated to me they're operating at uh, less than half percent of the capacity of those lines. And so, um, to me, I, it wouldn't be an issue. It's mainly a land use matter, and how they connect to the sewer is basically administrative. And uh, it would we'd have to be worked through at the time that they pull a building permit with the county uh, to expand the RV park. This is basically just granting them permission to do that. If there's complications later on, they'd have to work through that okay. uh, with the district and through the owner of the property as well as the city. Okay. So what we're doing is the land use piece Correct. for them to proceed in other aspects. Correct. They may encounter other issues. Correct. But... That those aren't land use questions. No. Does that help? Yeah, that tells me that we're still stuck. <laughs> <laughs> or we're not unsticking you. At least. Right. <laughs> we still got a problem. <laughs> All right. Does, could I ask you a question? Uh, does this have any effect on whether or not you get financial compensation? Their, your agreement with the city, whether you can get financial comp compensation from people who are adding additional load on the on the sewer district? That or? could affect it, all this. Uh, the payment of bills, the compensation, the load, what they said before when we tried to get the city to take us off over everything. Every little bit affects that now. But if this, if this is approved and they, 
and they tie six additional spots onto the district, you're you're able to bill for that. Yeah, as a sewer district, right? Uh, and there's the city adequate does, capacity. The city there, does. Yeah. There's adequate capacity to deal to deal with that. It's, yeah. Might seem to think correct. Uh, yeah. They're saying there correct. is. Okay. Okay. Has there been your, the tone of your voice there makes me think there's been issues in the past with capacity? The thing with the capacity, when we came, which has not this, but when we came to rec ask the city about taking over the sewer system, they had questions regarding our pump station down there, but the city's been able to okay to keep adding to it without us solving this yet which is what upsets our board because we really don't have that much say right now and we haven't got a new contract to negotiate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other testimony? My name is Becca Robb. I'm a resident of Moscow and I would like this... Um, as a recommendation for alternative um, waste disposal uh, as it touches on the RV uh, park proposed extension. Uh, I'm very pleased with the environmental mentality that I'm finding in Idaho. Our sewers are all over the nation over capacity and it's getting into our city waters. I don't know how the applicant for the expansion feels about this. I love RV parks. I love, I think it's a wonderful lifestyle and I'm in favor of the expansion. Uh, it might be an opportunity for the city council to respectfully um, make a statement about um, alternative methods of our, our waste disposal. Uh, there are many, many alternatives and communities, advanced communities all over the nation are starting to consider that seriously. And uh, with the consent of the property owner, it may be uh, time to include a, um, a statement, uh, re a recommendation for some of these alternative methods. Um, I've just Coincidentally, I didn't know this would come up. Been in the public library here in Moscow, reviewing some of these things for my own uh, property back east, and uh, noticing that our city waters are uh, kind of polluted from the from the human waste. Um, it's not unique. I've been around the nation, and it's happening everywhere. So there's many um, good projects going on. For example, that you could perhaps refer to to make some recommendations. I don't know about the vehicles themselves that would sit on this spot, but there are composting toilets and alternative waste disposal methods that are quite safe, quite clean, and odorless. I've tried them myself, so um, just thought I'd better stand up and be a responsible citizen and bring this to your mind. Thank you. Before you leave, yes. um, we got your name, but not your address. Uh, can I write it down for you? Or do you... I, I, uh, Four, 412 Asbury. Okay. Number five. Uh, Becca, B E K A H, Rob, R O B B. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Anything uh, else? So, uh, before you go, so your concern is relative to human waste disposal. As touching on this application, I don't want to hone in on this. Um, unjustly, uh, but it is everybody's business who live in cities, and we had someone stand up just now in a possible opposition to the, uh, what I, 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 I didn't stand up in favor of it because I'm unfamiliar with these meetings, um, but I am in favor of it, except when she stood up opposed because of a sewer problem, I felt it was my duty to bring to your mind a possibility of recommending that there be alternative waste disposal um, recommendations in your okay. decision. Okay. So, Mike, from the standpoint of land use <coughs> and waste disposal, we have certain criteria in certain zones relative to septic tanks, separation from wells, etc. Is there any land use related issue tonight that also touches on Becca's question? 
Uh, not really. You know, it'd all be state, city, or county requirements as far as uh, the transfer of sanitary sewer. And so they'd have to meet, you know, just all of our current standards. And uh, it, it wouldn't really affect our land use decision tonight. Okay. So thank you for bringing it to our general attention. Okay. Any um, other questions from the panel? <coughs> All right. The topic in general may be uh, for a, a different public hearing, but <laughs> if our state uh, and city and county standards are not keeping our waters clean, it is an issue for the local government. Yeah. I, I wonder if sustainable environment is the place where the conversation might most logically originate. That's another of the city's commissions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other testimony relative to this application? Would the applicant like to make any rebuttal? No, I think we've done fine. Okay, thank you. Close the public hearing and invite conversation. Uh, call your attention to the different set of relevant criteria and standards. The first one, interestingly, being this proposed use will or will not endanger the public health or safety or will not result in conditions which generate nuisances. It seems to me that the testimony we heard, there's some consideration of an interagency agreement around sewer between the Southeast District and the city. But there's no evidence that per, if that agreement needs to be sorted out amongst the parties, but there's no evidence that, that there is any public health or safety issue in this application relative to that. It's some agreement about the nature of how they coordinate their operations. Correct. Thank you. Joel's questioning about the land use, the, the buffer to the north, but I don't think that this operation is going to create disturbances to the highway or the trail. More likely the other way. I like the green space. <laughs> like the green space there. Okay. Um, it, everything we saw presented tonight seems to meet the uh, applicable development standards. The requirement that it, the type A landscape buffer be built if the parcel sells is what's addressing this point three. The proposed use will not be injurious or detrimental to adjoining properties. While it's owned by the same owner, that owner can make their own decision about whether they like or don't like seeing across their property internal property line. And I think that Becca's comment and others, that seems to be a use that we have need for in the community is for a while there was a period where there were no RV parks um, readily available. So mm -hmm. it's meeting a need. Any other comments that folks have? I think this is um, a well thought out plan. It looks like there's plenty of room on the property for uh, the additional spaces. It looks like there's plenty of capacity for the services for the additional spaces. Um, it's, it, it makes good use of the area there and uh, a needed use of the area there. And it sounds like to the extent that there are other concerns that there's something that the Leta Commission will have to take up in their capacity. Uh, but uh, given what we've been presented with tonight, uh, I think this is a good plan, and I would move that we uh, recommend uh, to... It's up there on the screen, basically, what you'd like to move. We right? recommend to Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, excuse me, that we put forth a recommendation for approval of the special permit use application uh, with the uh, condition that is uh, uh, on the last page of the... Uh, proposal with regard to the type A landscape uh, and that we direct the city staff to uh, draft the reason statement 
based on the relevant criteria and standards that uh, are on page seven of the report. Thank you, Gregory. Is there a second? second. Deb has seconded. Thank you also. Um, any other discussion? All in favor of the motion to recommend to the planning and zoning that they approve the special use permit, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? I think we have that one unanimous, Anne. All right. Thank you. So we are now up to item number nine, public hearing uh, proposed rezone of property located at 312 South Asbury Street and 313 South Asbury Street, LUP 2014-0010. Mike. Thank you. So uh, our last public hearing tonight is for a rezone at 312 and 313 South Asbury Street. Uh, once again, both parcels are uh, outlined in red at the center of your screen. We have 312 uh, South Asbury here to the east, as well as 313 here to the west. Uh, basically 7,500 square feet in size for 313 and 6,063 square square feet in size uh, for 312 South Asbury. So you have Asbury Street uh, running north-south um, here to center of your screen. You also have 3rd Street to the north, 4th uh, Street there to the southwest, and, and Lily Street uh, here to the west. You also have various other residential properties uh, which surround the area, single-family, two-family, and multi-family. Uh, commercial properties are along 3rd Street. Uh, you have the Remax office directly to the north, uh, Subway directly to the northeast, uh, as well as other various commercial services off of 3rd Street. Taking a look at uh, our comprehensive plan land use designation for the area, uh, basically it's all designated as urban mixed. Uh, you have a small swath of auto urban commercial there to the west, and basically the whole downtown core uh, is urban commercial to the far east, uh, to the east side of Jackson Street. Looking at what that means to be designated as urban mixed, uh, basically it provides for infill development and adaptive reuse of areas that surround downtown. Uh, includes a rich mix of residential and limited commercial uses, uh, which should be promoted through the development of small urban apartments, townhomes, and two to three story vertically mixed use buildings. Urban mixed area should provide a pedestrian connection between the University of Idaho and downtown and provide space for a variety of housing alternatives, uh, niche retail, restaurants, artist studies, studios, and personal and professional services. Taking a look at the current zoning designation of the area, you have the R4 zone, uh, which is to the south here, and you have the motor business zone, which is to the north. So. As you can see, uh, the current property at 312 South Asbury is all motor business uh, designated. You also have the property at 313, uh, basically has the motor business line dividing that property in half. And so that leads us to the origins of the original application was uh, from the property owner at 312 South Asbury. Uh, we had identified that this was occurring uh, in that area, basically just affecting that property at 313. So uh, community development department staff contacted that property owner and, and got permission to also uh, include them in the rezone proposal uh, before you today. And so that's how we ended up uh, with that proposed configuration of rezone. So uh, the proposal for rezone is basically to uh, correct those lines and rezone 312 uh, as well as the northern portion of 313 uh, to the R4, which is our multiple family residential uh, zoning classification. So basically uh, the dividing line between motor business and R4 would be on the north uh, property boundary of both those parcels. Looking, also looking at the area, you have the central business zone 
uh, on the east property boundary of 312 South Asbury, uh, which it extends downtown. You also have a, a small swath of RO, which is residential office on the east side of Almond Street. You also have uh, a small triangle of university zone, uh, which is currently student parking. So looking at the R4 zone, uh, basically intended to provide for the most intense residential land use as permitted in the community and to be applied where activity levels are high and adequate public facilities are available, especially near the University of Idaho campus or the city central business zoning district. Adequate transportation access should be given high priority in determining the appropriate location for those R4 zones. And looking at what the R4 zone allows as far as uses, uh, basically a, a large variety of residential uses, which include single-family, two-family, multi-family, uh, as well as allows for professional offices up to 2,000 square feet in size. So it provides for that uh, mixed use uh, that the urban mix designation points to. We define a professional office as offices maintained and used as a place of business conducted by persons engaged in the healing arts for human beings, such as doctors and dentists, uh, but wherein no overnight care for patients is given, and by engineers, attorneys, architects, accountants, and other persons providing services utilizing training in and knowledge of the mental discipline as distinguished from training in occupations requiring mere skill or manual dexterity. Uh, or the handling of commodities. And so uh, any use that would fall under that classification would be allowed uh, within the R4 zone. So that brings us to staff's recommendation is to recommend that the commission conduct a public hearing and upon consideration of any testimony presented, I recommend approval of the proposed rezone to city council. And I will note that the, the, uh, the applicant conducted a neighborhood meeting, which is also uh, the minutes and who attended are attached to your packet today. She also had attended a Historic Preservation Commission meeting, um, basically just so the commission could speak to the historic value of the structure, not to give a recommendation one way or the other about whether the rezone should be approved or denied. So uh, that letter is also attached to your packet tonight. So with that, I'd certainly be able to answer any questions that you might have. Mike, and the city attorney has reviewed the question of Wendy's participation, given that she's the signatory on the Historic Commission letter. Yeah, she, he sees no conflict. Thank you. Correct. All right. Um, opportunity for the applicant to speak to the proposal. Uh, if you please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Applicants, plural. You can pull that, yeah. A little shorter than Mike. Um, my name's Maria Maggi, and I live at 312 South Asbury. Um, I'm a writer, so I wrote what I had to say, and then you can ask me some questions. I read somewhere that it's best to leave a place when you still love it and feel thankful for all the gifts it's given you. I would add that it's best to try and leave a place better than I found it, and I guess that's why I'm here tonight. In the 117 years of its life as a residence, my house has been drawn in and out of zones and districts. When I discovered it was suddenly located in the center of the new Legacy Crossing Urban Renewal District several years ago, I started to pay attention to what that might mean. These attentions first took public form when I spoke out against a rezone of the east side of South Almond to commercial status. Although I did not succeed in changing the tide, I waxed lyrical about the need for trees and neighbors and how the people who actually live in the district put the residential in residential. I was assured my block would not suffer the same fate as South Almond. We all, including Bill Belknap, assumed that like the rest of South Asbury, it was R4 because it didn't matter 20 years ago when I bought the house. I had forgotten its status in motor business. But the banking crisis of recent years has made its future quite precarious unless it is rezoned. Now that I understand that fully, 
I did not hesitate to do what I believe is right for the future of the property and the neighborhood itself. In the last few years, I have also spoken up and walked the district to talk to my neighbors in support of the new Lillian Otnes Pocket Park and the need to keep Gormley Park as a city park. It was a pleasure to talk to neighbors I knew and meet new ones and have everyone agree it's important to have green spaces in the district. So I guess you could say I've been a crusader for the quality of life in the Legacy Crossing Urban Renewal District amidst the dramatic transitions occurring in it. Ironically, that effort is culminating in the need to speak up for my own house. But life is pretty funny that way. Perhaps there is a reason I was born the same year this piece of property and the one across the street were sloppily zoned into motor business. Whatever the motivation, it was decided in a time when the exact nature of that designation carried much less ominous weight than it does today. It's my pleasure to stand up for this little blue house that sheltered me and helped me raise my son and grow a garden and come to learn how to heal and manage a serious illness successfully. I think my request meets the criteria you need to follow, but I'd be happy and honored to answer any questions you have about why I am seeking this rezoning. And I thought I would add, um, in going through papers, I found the remarks of the building inspector who inspected my house 20 years ago. Um, and these are his remarks about the neighborhood. Um, the recorded use, I'll oh, see. Um, the house is located adjacent to the central business district of Moscow. Homes along this block of Asbury Street have been slowly converted to multifamily residential over the years, though several single family residences remain. Of the single family residences, some have had significant remodeling or upgrading recently and are occupied by older students or by long term residents desiring downtown lifestyles. There is no indication that the zoning or character of the immediate area will change in the near future. I believe single family use for the subject is likely to continue for some time as the improvements contribute significantly to the overall value of the property at present. So that was 20 years ago and when I bought the house it didn't matter that it was zone motor business. I received an FHA loan and the building inspector said this. So, um, you know, please, I'd, you know, I'd be happy to, um, you know, I thank you for your time and careful attention because to me we're helping to preserve the future of this intact old property. And what I believe is its place is a cornerstone of what makes South Asbury a truly mixed residential block. And I do have two live-in homeowner neighbors on my block still who came to my neighborhood meeting. One also on North Almond and uh, Jonathan Billings, owner of Archer Photography came. So, and a very interesting and educational time was had by all of us. <laughs> and some of the property owners are young. I would say they're young. I don't know how old they are exactly, pushing 30 maybe. <laughs> so they were really interested and in, they didn't know they lived in the Legacy Crossing Urban Renewal District. They didn't know about a lot of these things and they do now. <laughs> well, Maria, thank you for a very considered effort at, um, at bringing this forward. Are there questions that the panel has for Maria? Okay. Uh, Mike, just a point of clarification or education for us. The issue, if I understand it, is around the um, the banking issue around it being motor business versus R4 would be if the structure were sig significantly damaged, correct? Correct. Yeah, if the structure was destroyed by any means, you know, fire or just demolished, uh, basically it could only be rebuilt as a, an allowed use within that zoning district. So within the motor business zone, uh, the only residential uses that are allowed are through plan unit developments, which are intended for larger scale, mixed use, uh, creative uh, type developments. And so uh, 
as of about t 2008, uh, we started running into issues with the banks picking up on this fact within a lot of community zoning codes, and uh, it's hard to get a, uh, a mortgage on on property that it's in the wrong zone unless you have a, a cash buyer uh, looking at the property. And so um, Maria's is, is like other, you know, properties within the city that are just uh, either the wrong use, maybe the right zone, um, but they run into quite a bit of problems these days with that. And I think we've seen some of this on North Main Street and addressed it already. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, the larger ones, uh, city-initiated rezones, we've we've addressed that affect a large number of people. Uh, it just so happens that, you know, these small ones maybe get overlooked, uh, you know, if they're not within a large city-initiated rezone. Okay. Great. Thank you. So is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the application? If so, you know the drill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Victoria Siever, 121 North Lily, Moscow. I am friends with Maria, and uh, I live pretty, very close by. I'm on Lily, which is one block to the west, and a couple of blo I'm a couple of blocks then north. But before I bought my home, I actually lived in that area on Almond and Asbury, and within probably you know, a block and a half of Maria several times. So I've known residents and still and, and renters. There's a lot of houses, as Mike described it. There are still residents that are there. There are, but most of them are divided up into apartments or rented as a single home. I missed her hearing her hearing at her house because I was here for a city council meeting. So this is where <laughs> I usually am. So I want to be on record that I support this this zone. And I would echo something that she mentioned. I think it is very very important in these mixed use R4 districts that you maintain so homeowners I'm a homeowner and and that's part of that's that's really I don't I, I won't go into it and I didn't think about it before I came but it's you do you do have that contact with the younger students and and uh, younger families that are moving in and you are part of that mixed texture in that context and it it needs to be there so that it is a neighborhood and as she so well says puts the resident in residential you know, it's, it's very important. I'm also in the Legacy Crossing. I'm just north, north, uh, the north part of it. Mm -hmm. So okay. I always pay attention to that, too. So anyway, I am in support, and I think this is pretty much a no-brainer, but I want to be on record that this is the right way to go. Thank you. Other testimony in favor? <coughs> Rebecca Robb, 412 Asbury, number 5. I'm also in favor of the rezoning. Uh, speaking from the point of view of a homeowner myself back east, I'm renting right now on Asbury at the McCoy uh, apartments. Uh, so I'm a close neighbor, and that's how I met Marie and found out about the situation. But I'm in favor simply because of my standpoint as a homemaker, a housewife for 20 years, even though I have a career and a degree and understand uh, professional life. And um, I feel that our homes are in need of a higher value in our community points of view, where mothers and children and seniors and all ages of people at every phase of life can find uh, that tender affection that the, well, <laughs> I write about it. I'm a writer also. And I, I believe that it is a dear, dear home that we're talking about at 312 Asbury. Uh, I haven't seen the whole place, but in my visits, I noticed that um, Maria put in a um, tiled uh, oven. It's a very beautiful furnace. I've longed to have one myself, and she put it in, and it's just, it's a very pleasant manner of heating a home. Um, I, let me also speak on behalf of the hippie community here. Um, you don't find that very often. Uh, Moscow has something very valuable here in hippie history. And I've been around the nation. I grew up as one. And historically speaking, I'd hate to see that turn into an architect's office. Uh, it, 
if it becomes a historical resident, you could say that the poet and artist Maria Maggi lived there for 20 years. She taught at UI as a creative writing instructor. And uh, what valuable um, things she could, you know, contributed to the community. The hippie community um, is needed today for their environmental um, outlook, for their love of purity. And um, this house, to me, represents that, as well as every other hippie house in the aging hippie <laughs> community. Some of the young people don't seem to understand um, where we're coming from. So um, to me, it's, it's kind of a landmark house that I think is safer tucked away in the residential only zone. So um, I have a lot more to say, but you'll have to read about it on my website. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any other testimony? Opposed? Any testimony of a general nature? All right. Um, it's an opportunity, Maria, if you have any rebuttal. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will close the public hearing and we will deliberate on the matter. I agree with the comment that this looks like a no-brainer. I think, <laughs> if anything is this, this is. <laughs> it's a no-brainer because uh, it it just makes sense that you would include a house with the R4 rather than the motor business on the other side. It looks like from the from what I read in the uh, from the public or the uh, the neighborhood meeting comments and some of the other comments that were written. Somebody just somehow drew lines in the wrong places, and who know who knows why that got lost in the mist, mists of time. Uh, but I think putting a historic home uh, in the same zone as the other historic homes is just makes imminent sense. Okay, and, and part of what you might be speaking to is that the proposed rezone um, does serve the general public interest. This historic neighborhood, historic house in the neighborhood, is worth encouraging being preserved by not having it zoned motor business. Yes. Right. I, I, I guess I would speak on behalf of the Moscow Historic Preservation Commission, or at least because Maria came before us and I was, I'm was the chair of it, and um, basically that it represents an era of development in Moscow, and um, we would like to see that that history preserved and for future generations. So that's... Fairly I guess it's articulated in the letter that the commission wrote. That okay. So. Uh, oops. Yeah, it looks like just a pretty standard zoning cleanup uh, to help protect the house. I would think that it would be easier if you could get a mortgage on it uh, right. to keep it from being knocked down to make a parking lot. So yeah, pretty much a slam dunk. And one of the things I like about Moscow is you never know who's wearing tie-dye underwear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. That may or may not make it into the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? I just want to say that I also support it and um, appreciate the eloquent way you spoke to the issue. And um, I, I think that besides writing a, a kind of a wrong and uh, bringing this th thing into the historical preservation aspect of it. Um, it seems to me that this is not only historic, but it's sort of a direction that we ought to be going. Our, our things are trending, aren't they? I mean, keeping uh, moving toward neighborhoods where there's kind of a mixed use and that sort of thing. So it's, it's kind of got a foot in the past, but maybe a foot present in the future. Okay, <laughs> okay. Other thoughts? I didn't go ahead, Deb. I, I'm totally appreciative of it because my house is of the same era, <laughs> um, and there's nothing quite like an old house in all its history. Um, there, are, there are things going on in there beyond just yourself, and I think it's, there's no reason to even discuss it any farther. <laughs> so I would move to approve. You move to recommend to council an approval and uh, direct staff to yes, write, write the, the recent statement. statement. Is there a second? I second it. Kurt? All right, motion and second. Um, 
All in favor of approving the recommendation of the rezone, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. We have it. All right. Um, any last thing for the good of the order before we adjourn? Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. 30 seconds.